welcome, 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 welcome to uh, LinkedIn Live. Doing it on a special day and time this week. Uh, doing it on Friday because this uh, past uh, Tuesday was the Jewish holidays, and I'm actually doing it next Friday too because I have to prepare for Yom Kippur. Me too. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, the, the challenge now is we're trying to we're getting the breakfast menu going. Um, you know, for those that don't know, we fast for 24 hours, no food or drink or anything. I think the hardest thing for me is actually no coffee. Believe it or not. Whoa. The hardest thing for me is to get past five o'clock. Well, that's the thing. Like after three, four o'clock, like like, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I'm so happy, Ruth, that you're able to make it today. Um, it was, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things, but I think we were just having a chat right before about getting back into in-person networking and you're an extrovert and I'm an introvert. So this, <laughs> no, but, but I've become an extrovert on these calls because of, because you have to. Yeah. No, so, no, totally. I think you do. You do a great job at it. I never would have guessed you're an introvert. I, I am the first. I mean, uh, Brenda Miller and I are both introverts. The two of us are. And we totally, after these calls are over, have to decompress for a little bit. So it's just. Yeah, I'm the opposite. I I went to two local conferences this week and I was so energized after both of them. I'm like, I need to see people more. I need to see people more. It was good. Well, I know you're at, you're in Rochester, which is way upstate New York. Um, and for those that, that aren't that familiar, like I'm in New Jersey and it's not, I'm not that close to Rochester, even though I'm close to New York city. I am guessing it's probably about a five or six hour drive probably from me to you. Oh yeah. Cause we're on the, we're in the Western part of the right. state of New York. So you're not too far. <laughs> so you're not too far from Hannah Morgan. I know who is on my list of people to check out and, um, Kathy Lanzalaco. She's what? a Kathy Lanzalaco. Right. And you are, you're in Cleveland now, but you said you came from Columbus where Jeff Young is. And again, that's on my laundry list to get a hold of a yeah. bunch of people. There's some, yeah, Jeff's great. Hi, Jeff. I don't even know if you're here, but. <laughs> well, hopefully it will be. But I, I, and I think this is all going to be great in-person networking. I want to see people again. It's not the same thing. Not that I don't love our conversation on Zoom or doing other things, but to get out, to see people again, um, you know, you saw Virginia. Um, you Franco, yeah, I sure yeah. did. And um, we do a thing here in New Jersey. A bunch of us get together at a local diner. Marty Latman, Lisa Rangel, Bryn Tillman, Christine Dykeman, Alex Freund. It's just so great because you can talk to people. You can see their, see their smiles. You can hug them if you're comfortable with it. So I know you, you want to talk a little bit about what were some of the – how did it feel to get back in person when you went to Rochester for your couple of events in the past week or so? Well, I went to – a conference that actually was part of SCORE. If you folks know what SCORE is, mm -hmm. retired executives that help people who want to start businesses and grow their businesses. And it was a partnership between SCORE and the Rochester Women's Network, which is a fabulous organization. And I spoke at that about LinkedIn, but I spoke to my fellow business owners, not my usual audience. Mm -hmm. And I was just telling them, you guys got to be on LinkedIn, okay? You're missing people. So I, I explained how to do that. But then I went to a the women's um, leadership conference run by the Rochester Business Journal. That was yesterday. And it was there were a lot of people and it was fun and it was great to see people. And it was really loud. It was loud at both of them because people were just so excited to be able to talk in person about what's on their minds. And also, it's so funny, you know, you try to get the thing started and people won't shut up because it's like they just keep want to keep talking, which is great. I love it. You know, so uh, I, Laura Bashoris, um, do you know oh, her? Hi, Laura. I just, I was just at, um, the national resume writers association conference and okay. Laura was one of the presenters and she was amazing. So, so, um, who did you meet there that you hadn't had, had, had to, you hadn't met before that you met in real life? Like everybody. Let's see. Uh, Laura, I met Virginia Franco. Who else? Tom Powner. I finally met him in person. Uh -huh. I don't know, if you guys know Tom. If Laura's on the chat, she can remind me who else was there. Um, sure. Uh, Roz Rosado. Mm -hmm. um, Paula Christensen. Oh my so, gosh, everybody. Sarah Tim. I mean, just. Yeah. I, I would love. I would love to know who else is on the call from people that I know. Um, Rosalind Rosado. Hi, Roz. Um. Sarah Tim. Yay. You got your tribe here today. Well, I asked him, I invited him because right. I was hoping that they would put in the chat some 
some things to um to say that we could you know cover. Sure. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you um, about SCORE because I'm looking to get back involved in SCORE for a while. Um, what what do you do specifically? You're on a committee for SCORE? No. Or- I just knew we were doing this. I'm actually on a committee for Rochester Women's Network. I'm on the okay. membership committee. But not every community has a really active SCORE chapter, but mm-hmm. Rochester does. It's And I was just like, oh, my God, there has to be something I can do for this group, you know? So, so me, I don't know what I'm going to do. So let me ask you a question, which is a common question I talk about. When you go to – I've never been to a women's group per se, obviously, but – What's the difference, do you think, between how men and women network in person? I mean, do you, do you, or do you think there is even a difference between the two? I think I, I've i noticed when people are in a room, no matter what their gender, they do talk to each other. Okay. But I don't know. Ladies, you can, you can, you can agree or not agree with me. But whenever I've been to any of the events that are a lot of women, it's really loud mm-hmm. in a good way. And I think there's a lot of hugging a lot of hugging and people want to, I think they also, um, you have to understand. And, and I, I point this out to clients all the time. Women are natural networkers. Mm-hmm. How do we find out it, You know, if you have children, you got to need a pediatrician, right? Right. I mean, we, we're networkers. That's how we get things done. So I think that continues when you're together, even in a business setting and people make, people are social too, very social as well. And they and they get together. They make appointments to have coffee or a cocktail or something. I don't know for sure, but I don't know if men get super personal in a business setting. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I know that it's very hard for for a lot of men to listen to people. <laughs> to, no, because think about it in a relationship. You know. Part of the relationship is listening to what the other one has to say and then thinking about it, replying back. I, you know, some guys I know are so quick to just talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's like, give me a chance to take it all in. And, you know, I agree with Joey. It's a more, you know, Joey Himmel, Himmelfarb. It's Mars and Venus. It's true. I mean, I, I've learned over the years. And one of my favorite comments was uh, my kids went to a gifted and talented program on the, on the, in the weekends at a college and I, I met a, I met a woman there and she was a mom and we talked about stuff. And then all of a sudden other, you know, she said, you know, can men and women commute network differently, not, not better or worse, but differently. And you'll see that. And it's true. Um, so it's, it's understanding and taking, taking the lead that way, you know, and, and that was such an eye opener for me because I just assumed everyone communicated and network the same way. And that isn't necessarily the case. Well, okay. So, you guys who are on here and, and have met me or know me already, you know I'm a, I can be a little aggressive <laughs> when I'm talking to people, but but I feel like it's pretty easy for me to to get involved in a conversation with people that I see standing in little groups. I just walk right up, kind of mm-hmm. listen for a minute, and then comment on something and just go, "Hi, I'm Ruth." But it's not it's not that easy for a lot of people to do, and I think women sometimes have a very hard time with it. Um, there's a lot of discussion, especially at women's conferences about how women are often made to feel like their voice doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's starting to change a little. And I think men are, a lot of men who are in leadership positions are becoming a little more enlightened, but old habits die hard. Well, I remember starting out, um, I would have to leave work sometimes to do stuff for the family, whether it's taking kids to a dentist appointment or going to a thing at school. And I did it. And I would get looks sometimes like, why, why can't, why can't your wife do it? You know, this is a relationship. It's about a partnership. And I think, you know, back then, and we're talking 20 years or so ago, the perception was different. You know, even the idea when you lose your job, guys had a very hard time letting people know they were looking for a job in, in some settings. Um, a lot of us did because it was like a, a sign of weakness. Ah. No, it's not a sign of weakness. It happened, you know, you know, and, and life happens, you know, and it's just the way it is. And I think what I really love is I love opening up conversations. I love listening to what people have to say. 
with whatever the topics are because the more i know and i'm, I'm always saying this i'm always learning and it's not a tagline i do believe that yeah i feel the same way 100 percent. yeah and and you always um i find that i'm just always learning something that i can talk about in my in the context of my business too People go to conferences and they take notes, you know, on mm -hmm. the content, which I do, but I'm also writing down, oh, I can post about that. Or I didn't make that connection before. Oh my gosh, I have to write it down because I, I'll forget. <laughs> I think sometimes men don't realize how they come across, which is a big part of it. It's, it's the wording, it's the way you come across and sometimes guys have to police themselves i'm a big believer in that we, we have to be willing to say this is not appropriate this is not the right way to do it you know what one of my brother-in-law actually made a comment last night he will never be on this call and he will never never hear this but uh but i'll say it he referred <laughs> he referred to someone as hun h-o-n oh oh gosh someone yesterday <clears throat> yesterday one of the one of the speakers, I think she's a, she's an executive coach in Rochester, been around a long time. She was talking about earlier in her career, mm -hmm. she was talking about negotiation, like salary mm -hmm. negotiation, but she was just talking about her early career. And she was talking about how she had to, she learned whenever she went to a meeting that she had to change her mindset if it was mostly men in the meeting. Really? And she even had to change how she spoke in the meeting what she said, how she looked, what, what she said to get, to be, um, to have them pay attention to her and respect her. But she told me that, or she told the group that somebody called her sugar or something. Uh -huh. I think that was her who talked about that. And she's like, you know, right. I'm like, what? <laughs> Even when men and women are in a work or networking situation, the perceptions are different. I mean, um you know i'm looking at you know rosalind said here about being assertive women being assertive and men being assertive i think have different connotations oh she the speaker yesterday now and now i remember it wasn't sugar it was princess they called her okay. princess, and she's like what no she said if you know if men are assertive they're like yeah you're being assertive you know it's good if, if women do it it's the b word exactly yes and those of us who have a lot of women clients, I know we all talk to our clients about this too, about how what I get a lot from women is that kind of like self-effacing attitude or self-deprecating attitude that, well, you know, I've done some things, but like, I can't really talk about that. Cause it's like, we had a team and it was really the team. And I go, look, if you hadn't been there, would X and Y project have happened in the first place? Well, probably not. Well then, Hey, it's, you have to practice with people too to get them to say it out loud, right? I do think women, to some extent, don't toot their own horns enough with their accomplishments. I think, nope. for, for whatever reason, I mean, I because I work with with a lot of different you know people in transition, and I'll say this to both sides. I said, when you're out of work, you're still a project manager. You haven't lost your title. You're doing multitasking. Lord knows between errands and everything else. Um, don't ever sell yourself short and communication skills are so, so important too. And I think it's an eye opener when other people say that because it's just human nature to, to kind of take for granted some of your skills and, uh, you know, women, especially I, I'm a bit, I, I, I advocate for women all the time on behalf of guys. And I want to know what I can do to help bring the conversation to a, to an even keel. It shouldn't just be well, uh, the way it is and it's not fair. I appreciate that. Thank you. No, but it, but it's, but it's, no, it's good. good. No, I, it is because great. I, yeah. Because I, I'll say, I'll, I'll say to, you know, and women on LinkedIn, especially, I, I see this all the time, the perceptions and the comments and the messages and the invitations or quote unquote, and it's not a hit up place. And I've said to guys, we have to be the ones to support women. We have to be the ones, it shouldn't be women having to do this. I think, um, it's so important. Women have to be willing to have the conversations with us. And there's a trust level. I mean, I don't, I want you to trust me and believe in me. I'm don't just take what I'm saying as lip service. 
Uh, right. So Laura just said, yeah. yeah. It's a, they're trying to avoid being labels to be hard to navigate. Um, I want to think that more women in the workforce will make a difference. Um, there's, there's a lot to catch up with, with salary and, and other, other things that go on. Um, I just believe that it's so important to have a conversation, open conversation about stuff and not just rely on an issue to come up, to bring it up to the forefront again. Well, you know, I, I want people to, no matter their gender, I want them just to be able to say what's on their minds and to present ideas and share ideas. Yeah. And to somehow get over that fear of that they're going to be judged because I feel like in a lot of cases there is, there isn't any judgment really. I mean, I don't know. Have you, you know, you, you know, that feeling you have when you're thinking like, Oh, I can't say X because everybody's going to think Y about me. Well, they, they aren't. In some no, way. That's where, so. that's the whole thing about even posting and communicating yeah. on LinkedIn. People are so afraid sometimes to post or to comment because they're going to be found out. Really? You have to get, it's, it's the whole um, imposter syndrome thing. <laughs> yeah. We talked about that yesterday at the, right. at the leadership conference about what that's all about. It's, it's amazing because so, the speaker put up a, a list of all these really famous people and influencers that all mm -hmm. said they've had imposter syndrome. Like one of them was Tina Fey. She said she vacillates between being having a huge ego and feeling like she doesn't know what she's doing. Like there's nothing in the middle. I'm just, like, I'm sure there is, but you know, every we're all human beings. We have the whole range of feeling about ourselves and each other. And I, and, and there's a lot of posturing. I think a lot of the stuff we're talking about comes from that whole fear factor, you know, Absolutely. I, have to, I have to, I have to look like this and act like this. Cause like, that's what you do. And, and, so, and, and I think the self care part comes into that so great as well, because self care and self help so important. You have to take care of yourself and you have to be willing to share and acknowledge that. And that's a big part of job search is making sure that you don't, Yes, it's about looking for a job, but it's taking care of yourself at the same time. I, yeah, and I want to say hi, hi, Erica, Sarah, yeah. Shelley, yep, Deanna, yeah, hi, everybody, hi, got hi, yep. people. I was gonna say hi, hi guys, but no, I'm trying to say people. Hi, people. Hi, people. <laughs> that's, well, that's... I, this subject is so great because um, one of the things that I think about is how do you navigate this stuff when you have to present yourself digitally for a job interview mm -hmm. or for an initial conversation with an employer, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's unavoidable. I mean, this is one of the things we talked about at the national resume writers association conference was, was how digital is here to stay for right. interviewing. And in some, in a lot of cases, it's, it's, um, it's that the job isn't where you are. So you can't, unless they fly you out, you know, you have to do it digitally, but then there's this whole, this whole thing now with one way interviews. Mm -hmm. I was in a session on that where the questions are presented to you and you just have to speak and answer the questions. You're trying to, so you got two things going on here, right? You're trying to be yourself with a person and trying to be yourself without a person. Right. <laughs> How do you, I don't know. Feedback, people, people, people watching. Yeah, I'd be curious what people have to say about that. Huh? Yeah. If you have comments about what we're talking about, please put them in the chat. I mean, I would love to. Ch I'll chat with Ruth forever. Don't misunderstand. Yeah, come we're, on, people. We want to make this interactive. <laughs> um, you know, meantime, what were some of the other things that came up at the resume uh, convention? Things that are any, 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 any things changing with resumes? And, and, and well, that's... there was a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, because it's, it's, it's really becoming part of job search. And when you say AI, people go, oh, my God. Actually, it's not a bad thing at all because little AI elements can make the job search a lot more efficient mm -hmm. on the employer's end by really looking for and finding the people who are truly qualified. And also um, AI can remove bias from the search because yeah. you're putting certain parameters in there. And that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for a name. They're not looking for what the person looks like. 
but it it does present some um, some more work for the candidate because if you want to be found by these very specific algorithms, you have to present to these very specific algorithms. You have to be able to know what's the employer actually looking for, mm-hmm. and you have to be able to give it to them in a in a digestible format that they can can look at. Then and in many cases parse through their software. So job searching has just become, I don't, I don't even want to say more complicated, but it's just become, what would the word be? There's more to it than there ever was. I mean, my first job, what did I have? Like this one page resume that had like, I went to this college and I did this internship and it doesn't, it didn't say much about what I achieved at all because nobody did that. Right. I now think, it's all about that. Well, I think what helps is when you have a bunch of people that can support you as a job search group or accountability group, because we that way different people have different strengths in the group. And I think that is um, such an important thing to think about. Um, just looking at Mindy's comment here. Yeah, it is challenging. You know, intimidating when there's no feedback. It's challenging to know how to respond. Um, I've never, I haven't had a one-way interview in a very long time. And I know that the last time I did it, I was like a little freaked out myself. Well, I personally have never had to do a one-way interview. Right. And really most of my clients don't have to do them. From what I understand from colleagues at the conference is that it's, it's mostly not higher level professional jobs that are asking for that, you know? Well, the one I had, jobs. it yeah. was actually an interview I had with LinkedIn way back when. And that oh, was really? The, it was a LinkedIn interview there. And I don't, I, I never thought I'd get it, but I was interested, but I actually wanted to have a conversation and they ask you questions and they ask you also as part of the, here's a puzzle we want you to fill out. Oh, really? And talk it, talk us through it. So I think for me, the biggest challenge I have is explaining some of this job search process to people in a way that they can understand. Um, because I think sometimes it's overwhelming job search. It's frustrating. It's annoying. And Oh, there's so many hoops you have to jump through. Yeah. I mean, even if you, even if you know somebody on the inside, even if you've had an interview, I can remember having to go back and fill out, go online and put all my stuff in there and fill out everything, even though I was like going to get the job. I'm going, what, what, wait, what? I mean, I feel like it's just a, they just want all the stuff in their database for whatever reason. Well, and they do. Put it in. See, so. and the whole thing with the ATS is, is that they're kind of, if they're not programmed properly, it doesn't even matter. I mean, if you're just using it out of the box and it was an interesting comment this morning about don't put, if a field's not required, don't add it. Like, don't add certain information. Like, if, if they're asking, like, uh, for your sex, male, female, or something else, don't include it because that might be impacted with a salary question or something else. Um, just give them exactly what they want. Well, yeah, right. I mean, AT, ATS systems, are the way they're used, applicant tracking, the software is used differently depending on who's running it. Some people are really good at using it and some people really aren't good at using it. I mean, that's, that's the issue when, when I work with clients is I can't really, I can't really talk to them about something that's going to work for all ATS systems because there's a lot of them and, but they're all set up by different humans that have different levels of expertise and different concerns. And it's like, you, you can't, you can't, you can't correct for everything. Right. Right. So and that's, was- that's why it's so important to have to, to know that your job search isn't entirely about digital stuff. It's also about people and just submitting a bunch of applications into some portal somewhere is not enough to get a job. I mean, you might get lucky and people do, but I, I see these, I see these posts. I applied to 600 jobs and I finally got a job. Yay me. And I go, not yay you. You could have cut this thing in half if you targeted what you were looking for and made human contacts while you were doing this. Am I right? Yeah, I really. What I really wish is the conversation could be 
um, have nothing to do with with men or women or something else. It would just be a general conversation because um, when I talk when, when I talk to women and I talk to uh, teen women versus guys, it's a different mindset. And I think it starts with just with society, and it's so wrong, you know. Uh, the, and I don't, you know, I, I I I wish I could change things. And I think some things it's it's just you hiring people. And I always talk about it. it's human resources hiring people, um, and I think that is so important. Um, you know, again, if any of you, um, one of the things, and this is a perfect thing from an interviewing uh, networking, everyone here in the chat, follow up after the chat with each other, connect on LinkedIn. Send yeah, it, because again, that's. I'm interested to know because that's that's what's great about a conference, right? With colleagues in the industry, is that you can actually sit and, and discuss this stuff and go, right. what are you seeing? What, what ha what's going on with your clients? What are you hearing? And people will say, talk about an experience and then the other person can say, oh yeah, the same thing happened to me or I saw that same thing. And you don't feel like you're an outlier. Right. You know what I mean? So do you, do you, when you go in person to an event, I mean, how many people were at your two events in Rochester? Was it like 30, 40 or more or less? Oh no, it was, it was in the hunt. It was, I'd say that the, um, the business journal event. Oh my God. There had to be 500, 600 women there wow. at least. Um, the, the one the day before that was a smaller event. They're probably worth a couple hundred people, but they were, so they were a mixture of, of Rochester women's network members and score clients. Um, that was fun because people got to know each other who didn't a group two groups that never would meet each other unless they belonged to both. But, but yeah. Oh my God. Are there resume templates that Ruth likes resume? Oh, well, the thing is, I don't really don't use templates. I mean, I do from the sense that if I have a design that I've used before and it works for me, I'll take it and build off of it and say, why reinvent the wheel? This format could kind of work, but I know I have to change it for this client. So I, a little bit. So I no, I don't. Here's the problem. People go to Canva mm -hmm. or they go to Microsoft Word or Indeed which indeed's probably a little better at this because this is their wheelhouse, but the, the templates, especially in Canva, I have to say, they're not formatted, formatted correctly to be read by a tracking system. Mm -hmm. Some of those things are in boxes. That means they show up blank when they're being scanned by this character reader that's looking, it's a text reader basically. Right. And it's, you know, if you can't afford help, or you don't know what to do, you can never go wrong with doing a text file because that can be read. Boring, black and white, it's, it's, it's not exciting, but it's not wrong. Do you know what I mean? As far as being seen. So how much, so the question that, that comes up all the time is how far back do you go on your resume? And, uh, I think, and then the second thing is how do you account for gaps in your, in your history? I mean, those are the two I get all oh, the time. Well, see, I get those questions too. Mm -hmm. And when I have, when I go over career histories with clients, I often get so much information. Like they don't really know how far back that I want them to go. Right. Um, but I don't mind it because truthfully, I think it's more about relevance than time. Mm -hmm. And I've had clients that have had relevant experience that was in the early, like it was in the 1990s, but it was a bedrock for the thing that they're doing now. So I I may include it at the bottom as an earlier role and put something like, describe how it was a significant grounding for them in this mm -hmm. particular thing that they know how to do and they had successes with it. I don't go into huge detail because it was a long time ago, but mm -hmm. I want people to know that this person's educated in this field. Like this, they've been doing it a long time and they're good at it and they have what they need. Um, so that can be a reason to go back in your history. But generally, I think if you're if you're back farther than 15 years, you're you're probably getting into old stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem because sometimes you're dealing with a technology right. that's required for the job and like it's not used anymore. So somebody could look at you and go, well, that person's a dinosaur. You know, you don't there's no here's the thing. It's a marketing document. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no reason that you have to put everything you've ever done in your career on a resume. It's not required. It isn't a legal document. You don't have to, if you decide 
that you don't want, and I'm speaking, preaching to the choir largely with this group here, if there's something that you achieved or did in a job, you don't have to even put it. You're, you're trying to be selective so that you can telegraph to the reader that you've done things that are similar or related to the thing they need, right? That's the art form of doing this. And it's, it's why sometimes it's hard for people because my God, we're, we're inside our own path. Like if I had to do a resume myself, mm -hmm. I, would, I would pay someone in my colleague group to do it. I wouldn't do it. I know how, but it's me. I don't want, no. I need an outsider's point of view on the whole thing. So how, how do you handle job people that have been out for a year or two? I mean, oh yeah, that was the other part, yeah. Well, you probably agree with me, Ken, that it's not, it's not such a big deal anymore to be out of work, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people have been out of work because of COVID. And I think we're also, rec and also, look, there's no such thing as, you know, employer, employee loyalty, not, not like there used to be. And maybe it's a myth. Maybe it never existed. I don't know. But people change jobs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't go, you don't go through your life doing, sitting in one chair forever. You do explore, you do different things, you grow, right? But sometimes life necessitates that you stop, stop doing a thing for pay because there are things you need to do. Maybe you got to take care of your parents. Maybe you decided you need to raise your children instead of going to work every day. Important job. So when people have career gaps, I just address them in the resume. I just, I want the chronology to be complete. Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at a gap, I explain the gap in that spot, but I don't belabor the point. You know, don't go into a job interview and start going on and on about your gap. Because honestly, I really feel that most employers may ask you if they care. And all you have to do is say, we had an illness in our family and I, I needed to take time off. And I then agree. they move on to the next question. Yeah, you, do, I agree. you don't have to point a giant arrow at something. You just don't. It's, this is a, we live in different times. This is completely different. Don't, so I, I want to cut up some comments now. Uh, mindset is everything. Getting laid off killed my self-confidence. You need to be ready, feeling good ready to move on, which takes time. And I, I can relate to that. I'm sure a lot of the people on the call can as well. Oh, you know, Valerie, it's, it, nobody likes to be kicked. You know, nobody likes to be told that, you know, we don't, we don't want you now. Bye. Uh, don't the screen door hit you on the way out. We've, and I'm sure in this group, even in the career professionals, and there are quite a lot of them here, we've all been through that. I know most of us, almost all of us probably. Yeah, for sure. And so you, number one, you have to realize that you're not alone because it happens for whatever reason, right? Um, but number two, you have to realize that there's help out there. And I'm not talking about just paid help. Mm -hmm. As Ken was saying, it's about support. You, you, Somebody said yesterday at this women's conference that she has what she likes to refer to her own as her own board of directors. Right. She doesn't, she said, well, they don't really know they're on my board of directors, but there are like five people whom I trust mm -hmm. to get honest feedback. For, to, you know, I, they'll give me honest feedback. So I know I can call them if I'm having an issue and go to those people in your network that you trust. Say, I, I just got laid off. I'm, I'm really feeling lousy about it and talk through it with that person. It's really important to have a good network and, and, to, and to remember that some people you didn't think of as being in your professional network really kind of are and can be. Don't sit there by yourself yeah, and, I, and, yeah. and stew and feel terrible because there are people out here who really want to help, right? I mean, I tell, I tell the story that when I got to work, I got involved with the PTO and I met some great people there um, it, it helped my self-esteem. And then on top of that, um, when I was taking my kids to the different sporting events, I would talk to the moms and dads and I would be talking to them as a mom and dad. And I actually looked some of them up on LinkedIn at the time. And I was like, oh my God, this person is not just my friend's father, but he is, or she is. And I think it's hard, but you get used to it. I mean, for me to have to have a chat with someone was like pulling teeth. I was like, leave me alone. Oh, 
Well, I have two things to say about what you just said. The sure. first thing is, the first thing is getting involved in something is a really good way to emotionally recover. Mm -hmm. And, and also like, it's a great networking tool because you don't even know who you're going to meet. Right. We've all met people randomly in life who turned out to be great friends and contacts that we never could have foreseen. That's why you have to allow yourself that room to meet people and talk to people, even if it's digital, right? Yes, I think that's so important. Yeah. And getting involved, and it's also good to get involved. It just makes you feel good. Then, and the and the other thing, now I'm forgetting what the other thing was. Oh, talking to people. Yes. Okay. This is what I say a lot to people is the clients is, well, so tell me what you do when you first meet someone who you're starting to be a, uh, friends with. You know, you're just chit chatting with someone and they'll just, they'll tell me, oh, you know, I ask them, how are you? And oh, so where do you live? Or, you know what I mean? The same thing. We get so intimidated, especially with the digital platform. For some reason, we, we think that this that's happening now and even off to the side in writing, we think those things are not um, real life. Like somehow we separate those things out, mm -hmm. like digital communication is not actually relating to people like you would in real life, but it is. Yes, you're, you may be writing something or you may be speaking into a camera on your computer, but it's still people. So it never hurts to just ask people, it, I break the ice. Yeah. Like, oh, so where do you live again? Oh, how long have you lived there? That starts the conversation. Well, I, I remember yeah. last week or so, someone was doing an event up in Northern New Jersey and you know, I said, I'm in the area. You want to meet for a cup of coffee? And I, we met on LinkedIn. We figured it out. We met like three o'clock, like five hours later. He was down from Philly and we had a wonderful chat. And I've gotten much, many more coffee and diner chats now with people who I have not seen in a while, just to, just to reconnect. When I, when I was going to more networking events and I used to go to really general ones, which I don't do as much anymore. I, I would go in there and they would just, you know how they give you the name tags? Yeah. You know? Okay. I didn't write my name on mine. I'd put a question or a statement about something on my name tag. People would come up to me and go, they'd either laugh or they'd want to answer the question or they'd ask me, what, what, what do you mean? And it would start a whole conversation. I didn't even have to work at it. You know, it's like, there's all kinds of things you can do like that. Yeah, that reminds me. I yeah. should actually have the next time I should have my name tag connect with me on LinkedIn or here's how to connect with me or something. You know, just some tag on instead of the name because it just be that much be a great well, thing. The other thing is, you know, there's that great little handy dandy thing on your. I was showing a lot of people this yesterday. The on QR your code? LinkedIn. Yeah. If you go up into that little message bar up there at the top yeah. on the front of LinkedIn, over to the right, you see that little thing square with a little squares mm -hmm. in it or something that's your qr code and yeah, you can okay. scan other people's codes or have people scan your code so well, yeah. borrowing a page from laura who's somewhere on this feed uh yes. when i gave my presentation a couple of days ago i um i had a slide in there with my qr code on it and i went okay you know i know you probably have a lot of questions and i can't get to them all today but i'm I'd really like to get to know all of you who I don't know. So why don't you go ahead and take a minute and scan my code and just go ahead and connect with me. So some people got their phones out and we're just. Well, yeah. I, I, I got the look when I didn't have any business cards. This person gave me a business card and I said, I opened up my phone. I said, let's just connect on LinkedIn. They were like, what is that? It's like, I, I mean, I have hundreds of cards I'm looking at in my desk right now. Who knows why and how? And it just makes it so, I mean, now they're just relics. Um, well, I mean, I like business cards too, because they remind me of who I met. Right. And a long time ago, I used to write on the card where I met the person and why I caught their card. So I wouldn't forget, but yeah. So, yeah. and I've met, I've met quite a few people who do this QR code thing, or they do some kind of a thing yeah. in their presentation where they stop and they go, everybody take a minute. So if any of you do presentations, try it. Yeah, I'm going to do some call outs now for people who I haven't had a chance to acknowledge before. Uh, Shelly Piedmont is here. Um, content is way more important than how pretty a resume is. Oh, that's true. That's 100% true. 
Um, I, I do think you need it needs to be not cluttered. I mean, you need to be able to read it, right, Shelly? I mean, at, le at least it has to have a little air in it, right? And then you asked about Laura um, having a relevant section um, without dates on a resume. Um, because I know I got to the point where after the first five to 10 years, I had experience I wanted to share, but to go back too far is like, just I just like a where I worked in a, like a, a list or a couple of lines about what I did just so that it was acknowledging it because I am who I am. I mean, age discrimination happens a lot too. And if you look at a resume, I, I can turn off, I can take off the graduation years, I can just do the minimum, but I am who I am. Yeah, they see you eventually. They're going to see me, and if they and if you have your LinkedIn profile picture too, and I think it is so. You know, it is what it is. It's like a lot of things out there. You know, you you, you can't change the mindset. You just have to look at things in the best way possible for you. Well, right. I mean, you have to own who you are, in any part of your life. You know, it's like it, I was saying this yesterday. I was saying it to people in business who were saying that they were afraid because there was a session on just on social media for business on, oh, what do you, I'm afraid if I post X, people will think this about me. Um, and all I could think was, yeah, but it's kind of your vetting and selection tool because if people don't like what they're reading and they don't want to do business with you, yeah, you probably don't want to do business with them. If they don't want to hire you, if there's something there, it's going to stay there when you're hired. So like use this as a red flag in your search, right? And I love Brenda always calls it being experience rich. Yes. And 100% Brenda. I think for me, and, and you know, we talk about this a lot too. If you don't know where to go on LinkedIn, just start engaging in other people's posts. I can't tell you how much more uh, I've gotten from engaging with others. In fact, I basically take a day or two and just engage and do nothing else on LinkedIn because there's so many great people out there and just it's more than just acknowledging great job or a thumbs up or something but just add to the meaningful conversation for sure yeah I get questions about that a lot and I always say just just read what the person wrote and if something occurs to you that they left out or you want to share your experience because that's true then just write that absolutely but then there's it's, the it's weird. It's not like there's, having a conversation around a table or something where you can respond directly to what people are saying. I think the challenge is, is just being afraid to get started. The fear of failure, the imposter syndrome, or, oh, my God, what's going to happen to me? Is the world going to come to an end? No, it's not. No, it isn't. That's the thing. And sometimes I think that. Um, those of us who have been around the working environment longer and just life itself, we kind of figured that out over time that no one's thinking about you. No. They're thinking about their bad hair day or some other thing, you know, <laughs> like me. I don't know. Or, not, me without, or me without hair. Not, I, mean, I don't I, know what's happening. I, oops, that was the wrong way. You know, I'm so confused by this picture because – it's opposite of what I'm doing. It's like, yeah, you guys probably know what I mean. If you're on camera, it's like flipped. So, well, that's the other thing too. I mean, you know, we are who we are. I mean, I, you know, we were talking at the beginning about what are we going to talk about, and we just <laughs> I don't, no, it's true. I mean, I and we just let the conversation go in a certain direction. I mean, you know, you and I are in the middle of uh, preparations for the holidays, and we talked about. The challenges we're going to have um, being without coffee for 24 hours next week or water <laughs> or water or food. Um, and what's the over under on what we're going to actually, you know, have that first bite or something. I mean, for those that don't know, this is, you know, we got the day of atonement coming up next uh, Tuesday night to Wednesday. There's probably some Jewish people on our feed here too, who are, I'm sure there are members of the tribe. And be doing right that. Yeah. I told my husband I, I would like to bake an apple cake uh -huh. on Monday if I ever get to it. <laughs> I've never done this before, but I want to do it. Well, we, we have our list. We're going to, we have our shopping list for the weekend of all the stuff to get for break fast. Um, 
this year. It's the first time. Yeah, we got to be careful because after you haven't eaten for 24 hours and you try to stuff your face, you're going to be, you're not going to feel well, Ken. No, no, <laughs> I, I know. We, we, we have it down. The thing is, it's the first time in three years we're actually getting together for breakfast because usually in the past it's just been a couple of us. So, uh, look, I'm looking forward to it, but I, we've, I, I learned the first time I did this, you do not overindulge. Yeah, but some and someone also had a had a post recently on Facebook about about the 24 hour fast, and they're like, "Are, are we really complaining about this? There are people who are hungry all the time. We're, we're complaining yeah, about so. not eating for one day. People do intermittent fasting. I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> I know, but it gives us something to talk about. Really. Well, we need, you know, you and I, we, we need um, we need something to complain about because that's just it's genetic. It's, <laughs> I'm just gonna I, say. Well, it. <laughs> It is. It's, it's almost like you can have you can have a conversation with two people and have have five different observations. Yes. Mm -hmm. and the whole Jewish goodbye thing, which of course, a I lot know. of cultures have that. You know, you're trying to leave a room and yeah. you just never leave the room. Okay, no, I'll talk not. to you later. But one more thing. But yeah. another. Okay, bye. No, another thing. My mom and I are like that on the phone. I've I've learned to sit down until it's time to go. When my wife is finally ready to go, I don't. <laughs> Because it doesn't matter if I'm ready to go or not. You know, it's so I want to thank you very much, Ruth, for chatting today. We we yeah, have to do, fun. We have I, to do this again. What? Well, I, I love seeing all these my people, my friends and people I know and haven't really met yet. Like Brenda, I haven't met you in real life. I would love to meet you. No, none of us have. You know? I can't wait. I mean, um, I'd love to meet. I mean, we have to figure out a way to do this. I, I'm I'm looking forward. Um to meeting Sarah from the UK. She's coming over. Oh yeah? She's coming into the city for Christmas week. So we're we're figuring out a whole itinerary. You're so you know, you live so close to New York to the city. It's great. It's yes, it's, like, it's like well, five it's, hours for me to get there from Rochester. Great. Yeah. It's, it's great to get to the city once you're there. Getting there's a whole different story. Staying there's a whole different story. Well the good thing is when you're up at a certain age you have certain benefits in terms of transportation costs. I'll leave it at that. I'm trying to, what? Okay. The, the, those, it costs us so little to take a bus into the city, we would never think about driving. Oh, I, I if I go to, next time I go to the city, I'm going Amtrak. Yep, for sure. Because what is it to park your car? It's like 60, 70 bucks a day. It's it's not even the parking. It's how you're going to get in and out. Why no, well, that's it? a whole other thing. I don't know. I'm not that brave. <laughs> then, there's, then there's 15, 20 bucks in tolls. It's not worth it. That's that's another thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, I thanks thanks all of you for being. Yes, on thank you all day. very much. I mean, appreciate this very much. Um, you can always catch the replay anytime, and um, we're going to do this next week. I mean, next next Tuesday at this time. It, is it Virginia? Is she next? Who's on no, your show? Next? I have Andy Foot coming next Friday. Oh, Andy! Oh, what day? Oh, next Friday. Next oh, Friday because of the holiday. I have, to, I have to be on. I have to watch that one. Andy Foot and I we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff that we're see. We're not really supposed to talk about LinkedIn on these chats. We're not. Not technically no. But we not will. even that we love it. Well, of course <laughs> we love it, but I mean we're going to, you know, then. Andy and I are both Don Quixotes. We tilt at windmills. We want the best. We hope for the best. We know it's not happening, but it just gives us something. And um, since Andy is not on the call, I have a little surprise for Andy coming up next Friday. A little story. Andy could not, during the pandemic, could not, could not find Rice Krispies anywhere. He looked for them everywhere. You know, the, the cereal by Kellogg's. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Rice Krispies ready for him. Because he couldn't get them. <laughs> Apparently, the store brands weren't good enough. So that's gonna that's an inside joke. So those of you that know Andy, he he loves his Rice Krispies very much. It's one of his hidden uh, hidden things. So I you know I wish I this format is good, but I wish that we were on like more of like a Zoom format. We can do it again. Better. We can do it on a Zoom again. There's, it would be great because everybody could bring Rice Krispie treats, and at one point in the call, I'll just go <laughs> Rice Krispies. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Maybe we should do that. Um, I'm, I'm also partially an Uncrustables person, although I can't do that as much as I used to, you know, with the kids. But it's a whole discussion, a whole different discussion, now, food and networking, you know, and then how you handle that. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all very much for joining. A comment on the chat. 
Have a great weekend, everyone. Yeah. Happy New Year to those of you who celebrate. Shana Tova, happy, healthy yes. New Year. Um, hoping for the best. Hoping this year is a better year than the year before for all of you, too. That's for sure. And I can, let's connect if we haven't. Seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. -bye. Bye.